Praise be Jesus and Mary. My dear brothers and sisters, today we celebrate the solemnity of Our Lady Queen of the Seraphic Order. And I say solemnity because this is the patronal feast of Our Lady's Chapel. The friary here is named after Our Lady Queen of the Seraphic Order. Ordinarily, the solemnity would occur on December 15th, but because of the third Sunday in Advent and because it's a solemnity, it's transferred to today. And December 15th, because December 15th is the octave day of the Immaculate Conception, and the Franciscan order in a particular way was instrumental in bringing about the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. The formal veneration of Our Lady under this title, Queen of the Seraphic Order, uh, began really with Pius X, so it's a relatively late development in the life of the Church and in particular of that, that of the Franciscan Order. Pius X was a Franciscan tertiary long before he became Pope and had a particular uh, love for St. Francis and the charism and protected and nurtured and wished to encourage and uh, advocate on, a, on, on behalf of the Franciscan order and its, its place in history. And so he wished to bring graces to the order by uh, allowing the friars, sisters, and tertiaries to invoke Our Lady under this title. And so this so they were allowed to place this title, uh, Queen of the Seraphic Order, into the litany of Loretto in their churches where they, where they prayed the, the litany. And that was 1910. And then in the 50s, Saint, uh, Pope, Saint, Pope Pius XII, rather, um, uh, 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 instituted the feast of Our Lady Queen of the Seraphic Order on December 15th. So it's a relatively late development in terms of uh, its formal veneration, the title, our late, the, the veneration of Our Lady formally under this title, and in particular its insertion into the liturgy. But it comes at a time when Our Lady's place in the Franciscan order becomes more and more important and crucial, just as you know we've always believed in the things that we read about in sacred scripture about the Blessed Mother, as we do in today's uh, gospel from St. Luke. We have always believed in the Immaculate Conception, but there was this development of doctrine and the dogma was only proclaimed in 1854. Uh, and then there's this modern Marian movement with great prophetic saints like St. Saint Maximilian Kolbe and bl blessed soon to be Saint John Paul II. And there's this impetus to, to increase our devotion to the Blessed Mother particularly under the title of consecration to her uh, as immaculate, as the immaculate heart. And so just as this is true within the church, so it's true also within the order. And as I say, St. Maximilian is one of the great modern prophets of this Marian movement. And therefore, uh, and therefore this took place precisely within the order, within the Franciscan order. Um, I said uh, the, the, the act of Pius X to insert the title in the litany of Loretto came in 1910. If I'm not mistaken, that's just about the exact time when St. Maximilian Kolbe entered the Franciscan order. That's when he entered. And it was only seven years after that that he founded his, uh, his own Marian movement, the Militia of the Immaculate. Um, so this is a, a modern response to, to uh, Our Lady's presence within the Franciscan order. But when it was instituted by Pius X and Pius XII, it was specifically in reference to the charism and devotion of St. Francis. So this title was uh, formalized within the order precisely because this is the way St. Francis himself 
thought about the Blessed Mother. And, and not everyone understands that or acknowledges that who's familiar with St. Francis. St. Francis is known, among other things, as a great Christocentric saint. You know, a, a saint whose devotion to the person of Christ, to the humanity of the God-man is unsurpassed in the life of the church. His devotion to the mystery of Christmas. Uh, you know, he was the one who got the, the Christmas crush started. We all have a little manger scene in our house because of St. Francis. St. Francis and his order was the one who spread this devotion throughout the church. St. Francis, of course, is also known for his devotion to the crucified. He was uh, given his vocation as he was contemplating and praying before an image of Christ crucified and the crucifix became alive. And at that moment, his biographers tell us that he was wounded in his heart and from that time forward. He had this tremendous compassion for Christ on the cross. And at the end of his life, he himself became a living crucifix. God came down and imprinted on his body the living wounds of Jesus Christ. We also know that St. Francis, his, his inspiration for founding a religious order was to live the gospel, to reproduce in himself and in the friars the life and poverty of Jesus Christ. But he would also say, and his holy mother. So we all can appreciate very, very much uh, on the face of things, the devotion of St. Francis to, um, to, the, to, to Christ and to the humanity of Christ. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes people don't appreciate the fact that St. Francis is a great Marian saint and his order is a Marian order. And, and, a, and a, easy way to understand this and appreciate it is by remembering that his vocation from the very beginning was to rebuild the church. He went to San Damiano to pray before this crucifix. San Damiano is a tiny little church and it was falling down in the 12th century. It was already very old. It was d dilapidated and, and more or less a ruin. But inside this ruin, there was this old Byzantine crucifix and St. Francis was praying for the will of God before this crucifix. The crucifix came alive and Jesus said to St. Francis, rebuild my church for as you can see it's being destroyed. St. Francis very humbly and simply believed that our Lord wanted him to rebuild San Damiano because it was falling down. And, and so he did rebuild it. And then he believed that Jesus still wanted him to keep working at this project of rebuilding the church. So, so, so he went to another church in Assisi, St. Peter's, and he rebuilt that church. And then through the spirit, he moved to another church that he found falling down. And this was not in the city, but down on the plain b below the walled city of Assisi. Uh, and it was called Our Lady of the Angels. It was a little abandoned uh, chapel that belonged to the Benedictines. It was falling down. Uh, but St. Francis rebuilt it, and then after he rebuilt this church, he stayed there. He didn't leave. He felt like he had found home. And, and uh, his biographers tell us that this was true because this church was loved by our Blessed Mother more than any other church in the world, and it was often visited by angels. And later on in his life, St. Francis said, don't ever leave this place. He wouldn't allow the friars ever to have a home to call their own. He, he, one time he got up on a building and he started tearing the roof off because the people were calling it the friar's house. And he drove the friars away from places that became to appear like the friar's property. But the Porziuncola was different. He wanted the friars always to remain at this place because he believed that he, they, and the whole order belonged to the Blessed Mother. And so, um, St. Bonaventure says that St. That Francis was led from material things to spiritual things. When Jesus told him to rebuild the church, he responded generously and wholeheartedly and very simply by rebuilding the church that he was standing in because it was obviously falling down. And then he went from uh, that church to another. He rebuilt three churches, St. Bonaventure says, signifying the fact that he would found three orders. And then at the Porziuncola, at the third church, he founded the Franciscan order. He founded it. And then at the end of his life, he went back there to die. 
He didn't want to die in any other place but at the Portiuncula. And literally, if you go to the Portiuncula today, you'll see that St. Francis died li literally 20 feet from the chapel. That's where he, he, chose, he chose to die. And, and, and then in the uh, history of the order, this devotion to the Blessed Mother was lived out in a very remarkable and particular way in the defense and articulation and devotion of the friars to the Blessed Mother under the title of the Immaculate, the Immaculate Conception. And it was the order, among other efforts within the church, it was largely the effort of the Franciscan order to defend this title that ultimately led to another third order Franciscan, Pius, Saint Blessed Pope Pius IX, led to him uh, defining the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And, and, and for St. Maximilian Kolbe, you know, who is sort of tied in to the feast that we celebrate today, his understanding uh, of, of this grace of the, of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception was that this was something given to us at this time in the world. And, and as we understand who Our Lady is, her relationship to the Holy Spirit, St. Francis again, called Our Lady Spouse of the Holy Spirit. She was wholly united to the Holy Spirit in her sinlessness. God chose her in such a unique way so that she would become the mother of God. Her sinlessness is not just the absence of sin. The absence of sin and God's providence that made her free from sin joined her in a unique, ineffable and unrepeatable way to the Holy Spirit so that she alone is his spouse and all that he does, he does through her, be, you know, in a, in a way, beginning with the incarnation. God brings his son into the world through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Our Lady. She is the landing place of Christ into the world. She is the, the link between heaven and earth. And just as Jesus comes down from heaven through her, so we pass into Jesus and to, uh, to our heavenly Father, uh, th through her and so she is literally queen of the universe and in a particular way queen of all those who are dedicated to the rebuilding of the church because the rebuilt the church needs to be rebuilt according to the pattern of our, our lady's own holiness if we want to know what it means to be the church to live in the church to be a member of the church to follow Jesus Christ in the church it is to look to Our Lady and emulate her. And in the mystery of her Immaculate Conception, we come to know that every grace comes to us through her. So it's not just that we imitate her, that we look to her for her prayers, which we do. All, we should imitate her, and we should look to her for our, you know, her prayers. Uh, but every grace comes through her. Every uh, mercy of God comes through her immaculate heart. And our union with her, her presence in our life, her motherly presence in our life, is our way to God. And so we rejoice today on this uh, octave day of, of the Immaculate Conception, you know, and, and we, um, we turn to the Blessed Mother in, in the spirit of St. Francis and St. Maximilian Kolbe and ask for the grace to, to to benefit fully from the, the uh, insight of the church into this mystery and its promotion of this mystery in our times. This is a tremendous grace for the times in which we live which are so difficult and, and promise to be more difficult as time goes on. We need an advocate in heaven and Saint Francis turned to Our Lady as his advocate and queen the one who obtained for him his vocation. And so, uh, to conclude, one of the things St. Francis did in regard to this uh, patronage of Our Lady over the order, because of Saint, uh, the, the place, the Portiuncula, where he founded the order and his devotion to the Blessed Mother, he went to the Holy Father and obtained from the Holy Father an indulgence ta attached to this church, which we celebrate on August the 2nd, which is the um, dedication day 
uh, of the little church at the Porciuncola. And he did this, which was very unusual. The church rarely granted indulgences for the visiting of churches, and particularly a church which was unknown. This church, nobody knew about this church. It was a tiny little church in the middle of nowhere. And St. Francis went to Rome and asked for an indulgence attached to this church. It was granted, very unusual, uh, a plenary indulgence granted for the visiting of this church, although it was restricted uh, to, to the day of the dedication of, of the chapel. But St. Francis, Francis said to the friars, I want to send you to paradise. And it was in that context that he announced that he had obtained this indulgence. St. Francis wants us all to go to heaven and he has shown us the way through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, through her presence uh, in our lives and in the life of the church. And as we have devotion to her, we are fulfilling the, voc the Franciscan vocation to rebuild the church according to the pattern which God has shown us from heaven. Praise be Jesus and Mary.